get a change in the DNA code, you get a different mRNA molecule, which is going to produce or can produce a altered protein, a variant phenotype. Um, it does somewhat depend on where in the codon the point-wise mutation occurs, um, but uh, in, in many instances when this does happen, uh, you're, where you had an AT, the common genotype, producing the common phenotype, a, a specific protein, when that tautomerization occurs and you get a GC, you now have a variant genotype, and it often can result in producing an altered protein. Um, so we've reviewed the role of uh, protein tunneling in DNA and in DNA in, uh, resulting mutagenesis within the context of information feedback feed for dynamics with the space memory network, because it may explain uh, a recently observed phenomenon of non-random DNA base pair variation leading to beneficial adaptation in humans. Largely adaptive mutagenesis in the genome occurs via gene duplication and transposon mediated modification. And we'll look at transposons uh, later. However, there can also be pointwise mutations that change single nucleotides of the genetic code. This is the first case scenario we will review where single nucleotide polymorphisms leading to a unique and beneficially adaptive phenotype are occurring with non-random frequency. That is with some underlying mechanism of directional mutagenesis. Uh, and as I've just went over, what we posit is uh, being affected via morphic resonance of the space memory network. Uh, so this is uh, a study, uh, um, an article that I wrote of this study. Um, it reveals indications of environmental sensing by genetic apparatus driving non-random mutation for directional adaptation. Uh, so this study is linked in the members portal, uh, this article, um, and it's available on the Resonance Science Foundation uh, for later reference. Um, but uh, in our Unified Space Memory Network paper, we described how uh, quantum information processing, processing pathways in the molecular genetic system of the biological order, organism order permutations in a non-random fashion that result in natural directional adaptation and evolution. Information exchanges involving quantum mechanisms at the molecular level of the bi biological system with the environment and the entanglement nexus of the space memory morphogenic field give a kind of natural intelligence to the evolvability of organisms. Uh, and evolvability uh, is um, a, a very uh, specific term that's used here because um, it refers to the ability, the increasing ability of an organism to e evolve. Uh, so you can think of as like a, if you had a normal uh, evolutionary rate. Uh, so um, DNA changes occur in a, a, a periodic fashion at a specific rate uh, that might be relatively, let's say, slow. Um, well, what's to stop an organism from developing mechanisms that increase that rate, that naturally occurring rate of change in the DNA code? That's evolvability. And uh, what has been found is that most or many organisms uh, have natural mechanisms they've developed that allow them to accelerate changes in the DNA, in their gene uh, code, uh, so that they can have rapid periods of adaptation, uh, rapid responses to environmental stimuli, uh, and, and evolve quickly. And that's uh, uh, increasing evolvability of organisms. Uh, so um, when we're looking at the, 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 the uh, entanglement nexus of the space memory morphogenetic field, uh, we can ask what, uh, what gives uh, rise to the kind of natural intelligence that, that enables evolvability of organisms, uh, allowing for meaningful adaptations to occur at a, an accelerated rate 
beyond what would be possible under purely random genetic mutations. Natural selection can preserve innovations, but it cannot create them. That's a key missing part of the uh, theory of evolution. Nature's many innovations, uh, some uncannily, uncannily perfect, call for natural principles that accelerate life's ability to innovate. Now, in validation of our uh, U.S. postulate uh, in this study, uh, I was conducted uh, through the University of Haifa in Israel and University of Ghana in Africa. Uh, a team of researchers have found an accelerated, accelerated rate of an adenine to thymine nucleotide substitu substitution uh, in the human hemoglobin subunit beta gene, HBV. Uh, what is uh, referred to as the hemoglobin S mutation, uh, HBS mutation, uh, which results in substantial protection against severe malaria in heterozygotes uh, and homozygotes. Uh, so um, when, you, when you have a normal HBV gene and one copy of the HBS gene, uh, you have increased resistance to malaria. Um, that's a heterozygote. Uh, it has two uh, allelic forms of the gene. And homozygotes, uh, which uh, both alleles, both chromosomes, uh, have the HBS mutation. It results in sickle cell anemia. Uh, the researchers of this study point out that uh, malaria has been the strongest known agent of selection in human, uh, for humans in recent history as it has been a leading cause of human morbidity and mortality, often causing more than a million deaths per year in the recent past, making this study especially salient for understanding natural selection at the molecular genetic level and possible intrinsic mechanisms of adaptive change. So uh, the study compared origination rates of target mutations at target base positions in a six base pair region spanning three codons in the HBV gene uh, between genome samples from European and African populations to assess if environmental pressure from increased rates of malaria infection in endemic regions has any outcome on the rate of de novo occurring for the first time, literally from new mutations uh, in the HBS subunit. The study found that the de novo HBS mutation was greatly accelerated, uh, occurred with greater frequency in the genome samples from African populations where generation of the allele, the gene variant, has much greater adaptive significance than in locales where malaria is not endemic. The study is significant for molecular genetics in that uh, it's one of the first to measure mutation rates at a specific base pair position within a single gene. Uh, because of technological limitations, uh, measurements of mutation rates had previously been limited to averages of the entire genome or uh, across the entire stretch of a gene, limiting the resolution of vari variational rates uh, to large sections of the genome and all but excluding point mutations or entire gene subunits. Uh, so this is a, a fairly um, advanced and novel methodology that is giving resolution uh, at the scale of a six base pair region where you, they're able to study the mutation rate or the rate of change of a single nucleobase within this gene. Uh, analysis for, from the study demonstrates that the de novo mutation arose at statistically significant rates that surpass a randomly occurring mutation rate, meaning that the mutation was not random, but appears to have been directional. So there must be some mechanism uh, by which uh, the genome is sensing conditions of the environment 
and having a goal-oriented or directed response. And that's a pretty strong demonstration of scale-free cognition, uh, that there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, cognition, uh, uh, a, a cognitive uh, state uh, that is responding to the environmental situation at the genetic level within uh, these populations within humans. The results show that the HBS mutation is not generated at random, but instead originates preferentially in the gene and in the population where it is of adaptive significance, said Professor Livnot of the University of Haifa. Unlike other findings on mutation origination, this mutation-specific response to a specific environmental pressure cannot be explained by traditional theories. We hypothesize that evolution is influenced by two sources of information, external information that is natural selection and internal information that is accumulated in the genome through the generations and impacts the origination of mutations. Uh, so some form of epigenetic memory uh, that exists uh, within populations uh, that is able to uh, have this kind of environmental sensing and uh, affect adaptive responses in an intelligent fashion. Um, and this is just showing, you know, where malaria is endemic with the highest rates uh, and the rate of HBS allele frequency. So the, the rate at which this beneficial pointwise adaptive mutation occurs. Uh, and you can see that it's occurring with the highest frequency where it is of the most benefit for it to occur. Now, this can't be explained by natural selection because natural selection can uh, preserve changes, but it can't create them. And that's what I, I was saying that, you know, we need a, a theory that explains life's ability to innovate. Which currently traditional theory uh, can't explain or does not explain. Uh, so just a, a quick experimental overview of what was done. Uh, so sperm samples uh, were collected uh, from regions in the world with either high, I get my laser pointer going here, uh, with either high or low malaria infection rates. So high rates in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, low rates in Northern Europe uh, due to the differences in climate. Uh, mosquitoes can thrive in this warmer region and uh, mosquitoes don't do so well in the winter in Northern Europe, uh, no insects do. Uh, this map depicts world regions uh, with respective malaria impact rates, red for high levels and you have uh, white where it's non-existent or very low levels. Uh, whole genome DNA is extracted uh, and an amount equivalent to 60 to 80 million sperm cells per donor is subject, subjected to uh, restriction endonuclease enzymatic digestion. So uh, the, the DNA is extracted and chopped up into little fragments. <laughs> uh, the restriction endonuclease enzyme digester cleaves the DNA at multiple sites. Uh, including the HBB gene locus, uh, which carries a specific recognition sequence for the uh, sequencing step. Uh, interestingly, the HBS mutation blocks the restriction enzyme. Uh, so uh, with this HBS mutation, it's not cleaved. Uh, so it becomes easily identifiable and uh, it becomes enriched compared to the uh, native HBB gene. Uh, a primary barcode is added directly to each antisense DNA strand that carries the HBB gene uh, via a DNA polymerase-assisted uh, annealment reaction. Uh, since each barcode consists of a random sequence of nucleotide, each of the numerous tar target fragments has its own unique barcode. Uh, so they can identify each fragment of DNA that they're generating. Um, that, that's illustrated. Uh, by the, the, the color code 
annealed on the left-hand side of the DNA fragment. Uh, multiple single-strand copies are generated directly from each uniquely barcoded target fragment by linear amplification. Uh, so they're just amplifying the signal by copying each strand and annealing that barcode so it's identifiable. Uh, and so they have a large copy number, uh, which uh, makes sequencing uh, much more robust and with a higher fidelity. Uh, a secondary barcode composed of primer extension reaction for PCR is annealed to the right end side of each barcoded fragment. Uh, this procedure ensures that only full-length fragments or wild-type or mutant sequences that evaded restricting enzyme digestion carry both the primary and the secondary barcodes and will be amplified by PCR for high throughput sequencing. This novel methodology is one of the ways that the research team was able to get molecular resolution at the single nucleotide level, whereas previous studies could at best get resolution only at the whole gene or entire genome level. Uh, at the sequence analysis step, uh, sequencing reads represent, representing errors or DNA polymerase errors generated during uh, linear or subsequent ampl amplification steps are unlikely to be repeated and multiple copies and are removed. Uh, so they got an error, uh, a robust error correction mechanism for misreads. Uh, de novo mutations, such as the HBS mutation, see that highlighted in red here, uh, are easily identified by their appearance in multiple reads from distinct linear amplification events. And so with this method, uh, the researchers examined a total of more than half a billion gene fragments individually taken uh, from sperm of 12 donors uh, from these two regions. And uh, the region of interest, or ROI, is the HBB allele. So uh, in this region of interest, uh, they're able to quantify mutation rates. Uh, and in this region where this uh, single nucleotide variant results in beneficial adaptive resistance to malaria, individuals from locations where malaria are endemic have an approximately 2.5-fold increase in the endogenous mutation rate and de novo generation of the point mutation that confers the beneficially adaptive phenotype. Uh, so the average per base point mutation rates after um, you know, collating the data and quantification, uh, the base point mutation rates in the HBB, HBD is a, a, another form of the HBB gene, uh, are, are three changes in every 100 million base pairs um, for HBB significantly higher by 2.6 fold uh, than the baseline mutation rate of about one change in every 100 million base pairs as DNA is being uh, replicated. Uh, so that's about a 2.5 fold increase in the mutation rate uh, for the populations where the change is adaptively beneficial. And so in the populations where there is no adaptive benefit, in fact, it, it's kind of deleterious to have sickle cells, uh, uh, erythrocytes with that sickle cell morphology, uh, they have a normal baseline mutation rate of one misread every 100 million base pairs during replication. Um, so what is it that uh, affects the DNA so that it has a two, uh, an approximately 2.5 fold increase in the endogenous mutation rate and de, de novo generation of the point mutation that confers the beneficially adapted phenotype. Uh, this is a remarkable finding, uh, very surprising. <laughs> um, I mean, from a conventional perspective, um, from if you had just read Unified Space Memory Network and the entanglement 
entanglement nexus of awareness, you wouldn't be so surprised because this would just be, oh, this is what was just predicted and here it's validated, we're seeing it. Uh, but it is from a conventional, traditional perspective, it is uh, uh, remarkable because it's an empirical finding of non-random mutagenesis uh, and seemingly directed adaptive responses uh, to a deleterious environmental condition. And it raises the question, uh, how is it possible that the DNA genetic apparatus was able to sense this environmental condition and confer a goal-oriented response? Um, you know, it's uh, within the, the conventional purview, you, you need to find additional mechanisms, computational and additional machines, uh, computational mechanisms and additional machines that for some reason have evaded our knowledge so far, uh, even with the extensive amount of molecular genetics and molecular biology that has been done, uh, you've got to find this uh, additional gene apparatus uh, that is able to have this kind of memory and this kind of environmental sensing and the ability to uh, integrate that information and make changes in a meaningful way for uh, adaptive uh, uh, genotypes and phenotypes. Um, you know, it becomes a little bit more simple if you understand that holofractal nested organization of the biological system uh, as a gestalt of cognitive domains, a scale-free cognitive system, uh, where the same kind of intelligence that we associate with the brain is occurring at multiple scales. You know, it's occurring within the cellular domain. It's occurring within the molecular domain and biochemical networks. And you have the same level of intelligence. And actually, I posit, when you get down to the molecular domain and the, the genetic uh, machinery, uh, when you're down there, um, it, because of the coupling, the uh, close coupling with the space memory network, you have a hyper intelligence. Uh, so, you know, is this um, uh, evidence of intelligence at the molecular level or scale invariant cognition uh, within the biological system? Uh, just one moment. I might uh, take a look at some of the questions that have come in uh, and see if Maybe um, any of them are directly pertinent to what has just been discussed. I could answer them now. Okay, uh, it doesn't look like uh, the questions that have come in are directly related uh, to this study. Um, you know, I wanted to see if, if, you know, there was a specific question about what was done uh, I could answer it now, but uh, it looks like uh, these questions might be best. The questions that have come in might be best to save uh, towards the end of the review here. Uh, so uh, how, how do we explain this finding of uh, non-random changes in the DNA and adaptive responses? Uh, Mutation-specific origination rates are influenced by the complex genetic and epigenetic background. Uh, knowing that the HBS mutation is advantageous in heterozygotes under malarial pressure, uh, how do we interpret these results? Uh, we can take the conservative view, the traditional view, and from the disconnected worldview perspective, uh, that there is nothing remarkable about what has been documented in this latest study. Uh, that for a reason unrelated to adaptation, some individuals have a genomic fragility in the HBB gene uh, that generates the HBS mutation at a high rate. Accordingly, it's just a coincidence uh, that HBS provides protection against malaria, even more so if that fragility uh, applies more to populations that are specific to a high malaria impact region like Africa. So uh, the traditional explanation would be it's just coincidence. Uh, the simplistic coincidental explanation would suffice if it were not for other documented cases of directional evolvability. 
uh, empirical indications of the existence of some kind of genetic or epigenetic mechanisms that enable directional mutagenesis via increased genetic or epigenetic modifications. Uh, so, you know, when if it's, if it's a one-off event, you might be able to get away with saying it's just a coincidence. Uh, but uh, there actually uh, has been previous studies that have shown uh, this same kind of uh, non-random mutagenesis conferring beneficial adaptations in a seemingly directed goal-oriented manner. Uh, some of these previous studies though were with uh, bacteria. And one of the things is that uh, because of you know the, the disconnected purview within science, um, you know, it's not seen that bacteria and their genetic processes are related to things like us, like humans and metazoans and multicellular organisms. Um, but you know, so th this isn't though the first time that this has been observed. So you know, the the uh, wave it away and explain it as just coincidence becomes kind of a, a tenuous argument. Uh, because uh, there appears to be uh, some kind of uh, mechanism underlying uh, this increased evolvability of organisms and their ability to direct their own uh, evolution and beneficial adaptive changes. Uh, one possible mechanism uh, that doesn't rely on is just coincidence. Uh, so, you know, we're going to actually do some science here, uh, is what's called adenosine to enosine RNA editing, A to I RNA editing. Uh, enosine is uh, a particular um, isoform uh, of a, a nucleoside. Um, there's actually, you know, over a hundred different kinds of nucleosides, uh, with especially uh, um, RNA nucleosides. Um, th there's been over 150 different kind of changes that have been identified that can be conferred on a nucleoside to change its code. Uh, so there's actually, and we discussed some of that uh, in the, the Unified Space Memory Network paper. Um, uh, this is catalyzed by uh, an enzyme called ADAR, uh, adenosine deaminase that acts on RNA, ADAR. Uh, family of enzymes. Uh, specific adenosines are converted to enosine, a mimic of guanosine during translation and other biological processes. Uh, so when this uh, change occurs, um, it effectively uh, edits the mRNA transcript so that even though the DNA code might have been spe specifying one particular amino acid, uh, the mRNA code is changed by this ADAR enzyme, uh, and uh, your uh, adenosine is now switched to a guanosine. That's how it's read, it, because it has a it becomes a inosine. Uh, so uh, this is a way to edit mRNA transcripts and get novel phenotypes, uh, novel proteins, without changing directly the DNA code. Uh, when editing occurs uh, at a uh, non-synonymous position of a codon within an mRNA, the codon is recoded to another amino acid. Uh, thus, editing has the potential to change amino acids both spatially and temporally in response to environmental change. Uh, so it could be that uh, there's some kind of uh, signaling, environmental signaling that is being relayed to the ADAR enzymes uh, so that uh, they're, they're changing uh, the mRNA transcripts when uh, there's a high malaria impact present. Uh, so uh, A to I RNA editing can mechanistically increase the adenosine to guanosine mutation rate so that recurring evolved processes acting on DNA and or RNA through epigenetic modifications, RNA editing, and other mechanisms may lead directly to their own replacement and simpli simplification via DNA mutations that arise in the course of evolution from these processes of uh, molecular nature, mechanistically linking regulatory activity with structural mutational changes. 
so uh, this is the hypothesis, uh, the theory uh, put forth by the studies of the authors. Uh, uh, and it's a, a, a interesting postulate uh, in that what, what they're saying is that uh, you have a pre-existing epigenetic regulatory machinery uh, that is able to have a rapid response, producing novel variant phenotypes that uh, are beneficially adaptive. Um, and while that's operational, it could be simplified um, uh, and replaced uh, via just direct DNA mutations um, so that, you know, it's no longer involving this kind of uh, co relatively complex pathway of RNA editing, um, but actually it becomes uh, simplified and solidified as just this DNA point mutation. Uh, but you, you have a pre-existing structure that is assisting it along until you get uh, that response in the DNA. Uh, and this kind of acts as a bridge or a crutch for the traditional theory because, um, you know, uh, cha changes in the DNA are thought to occur rarely. Uh, and when it comes to changes that are beneficial, extremely rarely. <laughs> um, so, you know, th this kind of, uh, th this perspective enables a bridge uh, for how you can have a slow rate of change in the DNA, uh, but still have uh, a, a mechanism for environmental sensing and affecting changes that are needed uh, for uh, environmental response. Now, uh, from our perspective, though, you would explain this via a morphic resonance information exchange via the space memory network. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily involve A to I or any editing, uh, but that tautomerization that I explained uh, at the outset of the review uh, in which um, you're having information exchange with the entanglement nexus of the space memory network. Uh, so the uh, entangled nucleo bases of the DNA, and it's been empirically demonstrated that they are quantum entangled. In fact, uh, it looks like quantum entanglement holds DNA together, uh, like with a veritable force. Um, you can have, uh, you have uh, information exchange. And so this is like environmental signals occurring through that entanglement network, which means through the micro wormhole transtemporal connectivity circuits of space memory. Uh, and they can affect uh, with a, a higher probability, a tautomerization that confers that beneficial mutation. Uh, so it's hyper intelligent, or we could just say it's an intelligent mechanism uh, and it's goal oriented. And that's where a term awareness and conscious agent starts to come into play. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely a demonstration of, of a scale free cognition, a scale free cognitive domain. Uh, since uh, the conventional paradigm of purely mechanistic science sees natural or innate intelligence as threatening, uh, they want to describe almost everything as autonomous mechanism and any manifestation of intelligence as a computational mechanism. So it's really popular right now that you, you just equate everything to a mindless program, and hence everything becomes a kind of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's just programmed responses, it's clockwork, it's mechanism, it's computation. Uh, the, the idea that there may be directional plasticity and evolvability and a kind of innate molecular intelligence that can shape mutagenesis and adaptive changes will be strongly resisted uh, within the, the conventional or traditional uh, scientific thought. Uh, so we'll look at other examples where natural sentience or scale-free cognition is directing evolvability. Because uh, in science, you know, quantification, direct observation, rigorous controlled studies, that's how you determine the validity of a model, a hypothesis.
Uh, and so one of the uh, very exciting recent studies demonstrating this natural sentience, this uh, hyperintelligence, innate hyperintelligence, and non-random mutagenesis and directionality of evolution uh, is a finding that octopuses edit their own genetic code to adapt to cold water. Uh, recent studies uh, have demonstrated that cephalopods can adapt to changes in temperature by tweaking their genetic code to alter the proteins that are made in their nerve cells. Uh, so octopi, uh, octopuses are uh, for kilotherms, it means uh, an organism that's unable to regulate its own body temperature. You know, they're also invertebrates, you know, they don't have a skeletal system. So, you know, they're kind of relatively alien to, to us uh, mammalian vertebrate species. <laughs> but uh, in uh, poor kilotherms, uh, if temperature changes challenge the integration of physiological function. Uh, within the complex nervous systems of the behaviorally sophisticated cephalopods, these problems are substantial. Uh, you know, so you, you've got this behaviorally complex, uh, demonstrably intelligent species, the, the cephalopods, uh, the family species, uh, and, you know, that kind of nerve functioning that correlates with that kind of complex behavior and intelligence. Um, physiologically, it can be significantly hampered by cold temperatures. Uh, especially since um, cephalopods can't regulate their own body temperature. Uh, RNA editing by adenosine deamination, what we just looked at, R, uh, A to I RNA editing, uh, is a well-positioned mechanism uh, for environmental acclimation, rapid environmental responses uh, within the genotype. Uh, so this study uh, is reporting that the neural proteome of the kind of common octopus uh, undergoes massive reconfigurations via RNA editing following a temperature challenge. Over 13,000 codons were found to be affected and many alter proteins that are vital for neuronal processes. Uh, for two highly temperature sensitive examples, recoding tunes protein function. For synaptogammon, uh, synaptogammon is uh, a very dynamic protein involved in membrane binding, uh, especially during uh, neurotransmitter signaling uh, in the synapse. Uh, it's a key component of uh, calcium-dependent neurotransmitter release. Um, they found that uh, this RNA editing in the octopus is rapid response RNA editing is changing the dynamics of this vesicle binding and neurotransmitter release via changes in a synaptic gammon uh, via the changes conferred from the uh, RNA editing. Uh, as well, uh, for kinesin, uh, a motor protein uh, driving exonal transport uh, editing regulates transport velocity down microtubules. Uh, and so this is actually a coupled mechanism here, a, a coupled dynamic within the nerve cell. Uh, these, you have uh, a nerve, uh, a, a core filament bundle within the axon of neurons uh, that is highly ordered microtubule, a high, highly ordered microtubule filament bundle. Uh, and dynein, this motor protein, walks along uh, these microtubules from the cell body of the neuron down to the uh, uh, synapse, uh, the synaptic junction, uh, where they carry those vesicles that have the neurotransmitters. Uh, so in both of, in two of these uh, rapid response RNA editing found in octop uh, uh, this octopus species, um, it, it was uh, directly affecting the rate of transport of these vesicles and their binding and release into the synapse. Uh, so, you know, clear, direct uh, uh, physiological changes that are being uh, directed 
not, i.e. not occurring uh, randomly or haphazardly. Uh, these data show that uh, A to I editing tunes neurophysiological function in response to temperature in octopus and, mo uh, and most likely other uh, cephalot species. Uh, and indeed, uh, a concurrent study with this uh, found the same kind of uh, phenomenon occurring in squid. Uh, so um, Joshua Rosenthal at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and his colleagues tested how uh, California two-spotted octopuses uh, respond to changes in water temperature uh, in tanks. They gradually shifted the temperature to around 13 degrees Celsius, or about 55 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, for one group and 22 degrees Celsius or about 72 degrees Fahrenheit for another group. Uh, and the octopuses uh, in the colder tank made more than 13,000 edits to their RNA uh, that led to, to changes in the resulting proteins. Uh, so, you know, they, they had these two samples, one in high temperature, one in low temperature. Uh, they extracted the transcriptome, uh, the, the RNA messenger RNA, body of messenger RNA within the neurons of these two groups. Uh, and they could quantify the uh, percentage of RNA editing occurring. Uh, and this group that was placed in this uh, non-harmonious uh, uh, situation, this uh, you know, relatively inhospitable environmental condition, uh, had a rapid increase in uh, RNA editing uh, with at least 13,000 RNA edits identified. Uh, what is interesting um, about cephalopods is they, re they recode proteins in a magnitude that is much higher than any other species or indeed any other family of animals that we know about. Uh, although not nearly as extensive as cephalopods, the only other organism with a comparable level of recoding is humans, uh, specifically in the neuronal information processing tissue, i.e. Uh, the brain. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, despite the evolutionary distance between humans and cephalopods, which are like veritable alien organisms uh, to each other, especially, you know, just you know, speaking biologically, uh, there is this convergent evolution of RNA gene editing networks that are directly correlated with higher order cognitive functions. Uh, so, you know, this is pointing towards a universal mechanism of uh, non-random mutagenesis, uh, non-random evolvability um, across two evolutionarily greatly distinct uh, species. That leads to higher cognitive function, uh, you know, as demonstrated by the, the complex behavioral patterns of, of uh, octopus and humans, uh, and also uh, the, the intelligent behavior demonstrable in both those two species. Uh, and so this is a, another um, article that I wrote uh, last year. Uh, on uh, the convergent function of retrotransposons in the octopus brain, uh, convergent and that uh, it, it's a similar mechanism observed in humans uh, that drives sophisticated cognitive capabilities. Um, oh, uh, what, one last thing I, I, I should point out about this is that, um, you know, this is talking about the uh, A to I RNA editing and other RNA editing modalities. But uh, if you recall from uh, the uh, hypothesis, the postulate of that previous study with the HBS mutation rate in humans, uh, you know, one of the things that those authors uh, postulated is that this uh, A to I RNA editing uh, may just be, uh, a, in some instances, may serve as kind of a placeholder uh, until that kind of uh, increased DNA mutation rate can be conferred directly within the DNA. Uh, so um, 
the 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 R, RNA editing has a high degree of plasticity, uh, but you know it's already been predicted uh, that that might be translated into the DNA uh, given an, uh, enough time. Uh, so uh, compared uh, to humans, the, the octopus is in many ways uh, alien. You know, it's an invertebrate uh, with the only hard part being a chitinous beak. It has eight arms where most of its ne neuronal tissue or brain is located. Uh, in many species, it can shape shift and change the color of its integument to match its surrounding with near perfect adaptive camouflage. Uh, however, despite the many differences, uh, many uh, octopus species and indeed many cephalod species uh, do share one similarity with that of humans, uh, sophisticated cognitive capabilities, including problem solving, forethought, and creative ingenuity. Uh, since octopus species have a rather large evolutionary distance from humans, mammals, or even vertebrates, a study of the cellular and molecular underpinning of their sophisticated cognitive capabilities can give us insight into what specific me uh, mechanisms enable and drive intelligence in animals. Interestingly, the molecular underpinnings of neuronal plasticity and intelligence are found all the way through to the core of the cell in the genome. Well, again, um, reiterating that holofractal nested uh, organization of cognitive domains, uh, scale invariant cognitive systems that comprise the uh, living organism. Uh, so in the neurons that are most associated with learning and uh, memory, such as those found in the hippocampus of human and mammalian brains, uh, there is found some of the highest activity in any tissue of transposable elements. Uh, this is a, a schematic depiction of a retrotransposon. Uh, it's able to bind form a ribonucleoprotein complex, undergo reverse transcription, and reintegrate at a new location within the genome. It's a jumping gene, uh, transposable genetic element. And these are very numerous and very active in humans and apparently in cephalopod species. Uh, and it's been thoroughly documented, uh, their role in uh, being instrumental in uh, evolution and adaptive changes, especially uh, things like growing large brains. Um, so in the, the uh, neurons that are most associated with learning and memory, such as those found in the hippocampus of human and mammalian brains, uh, uh, there's found the highest activity in any tissue of transposable elements, uh, which are proper, uh, popularly referred to as mobile genetic elements or jumping genes. Uh, so much so that the genomic heterogeneity produced by transposable element-generated recombination produces genomic mosaicism in the adult human brain. Uh, you, you, uh, you, in your brain, uh, it's a, uh, there's genetic mosaicism. Uh, the neurons don't have the same genome. Uh, they have different genomes. Uh, while the exact function of the somatic cell, uh, that's the adult cell, nuclear recombination, driven by transposons and retrotransposons is unknown, uh, particularly in functions of learning, memory, and intelligence. It is obvious that the generation of such genomic heterogeneity will produce more dynamic neuronal plasticity. Uh, neurons with a wider array of unique phenotypes and variations that can facilitate greater adaptive information processing. Uh, so here, here at the uh, Resonance Science Foundation, uh, we are researching whether such somatic cell nuclear recombination may play direct roles in information processing uh, where memory functions are taking place at the molecular or quantum level, including DNA recombination events that are linked with the uh, entanglement structure of the space memory network, and hence that hyperintelligent system, that hyper-intelligent universal field uh, to direct non-random changes.
So um, here is one of the studies of emerging roles of long non-coding RNAs as drivers of brain evolution. Um, what is being discovered is that it is the non-coding regions of the genomes. That's what is uh, you know, historically referred to as the junk DNA. Uh, of course, you know, I, I don't think there's many molecular biologists or molecular geneticists left that still refer to that as a junk DNA because it's just obviously not. That's quite the misnomer. Um, but what, what's uh, been discovered is that the, the, those non-coding regions of the genome that uh, contribute most to what makes us unique individuals and underpin processes involved in intelligence and cognitive capabilities um, involve uh, things like long non-coding RNA, non-protein coding DNA segments. Uh, in fact, approximately 80% of the mammalian genome is transcribed in a cell-specific manner and the majority of that cell-specific transcription is of non-coding regions. Um, and it just non-coding protein regions. Uh, they, they, it still codes, but actually what it's coding for often is the three-dimensional and even four-dimensional spatio-temporal program of, and configuration of uh, RNA molecules, uh, which are the, the predominant regulatory gene mechanisms within the cell. Uh, these long non-coding RNAs are emerging as important regulators and gene expression networks by controlling nuclear architecture and transcription in the nucleus and by modulating mRNA stability, translation, and post-translational modifications in the cytoplasm. Uh, so we see the integral and critical role of uh, transposable elements, retrotransposons, and long non-coding RNAs in evolution development and intelligence of animals uh, with striking and significant examples in the human lineage uh, where transposable, transposable element insertions have strongly affected human evolution and the high speed of evolution of the human lineage, which has been exceptional compared with other animals. The high speed of evolution of human lineage brain size is recognized by comparison with uh, fossilized brain sizes and uh, evolution of the lineage leading to humans during the last several million years was striking. In this period, the brain and our lineage tripled in mass. Uh, the function of the brain also changed rapidly. Uh, but what we know is that the result was uh, the modern human brain. Uh, and um, it is emerging that this undoubtedly involved the, uh, the function of these long non-coding RNAs uh, and transposons, uh, just as was documented, documented recently in octopus species as leading to greater intelligence of the organism. Uh, mammalian genomes encode tens of thousands of long non-coding RNAs, uh, which are capable of interactions with DNA, RNA, and protein molecules, thereby enabling a variety of transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulatory activities. Strikingly, about 40% of long non-coding RNAs are expressed specifically in the brain with precisely regulated temporal and spatial expression patterns. Hence, uh, in addition to the brain size, structural reorganization and adaptive changes represent crucial harm, hallmarks of human brain evolution. Long non-coding RNAs are increasingly reported to be involved in neurodevelopmental processes suggested to underlie human brain evolution, including proliferation, neurite outgrowth, and synaptogenesis, as well as in neuroplasticity. Hence, evolutionary human brain adaptations are proposed to be essentially driven by long non-coding RNAs. Um, and these uh, uh, same kind of um, long non-coding RNAs and line retrotransposons uh, have been uh, found to be uh, expressed in a converge evolutionarily convergent manner in um, cephalopods. Um, so an international team of researchers uh, have conducted a comprehensive study of the octopus neuronal transcriptome, uh, sequencing the body of RNA molecules within the neurons of octopus species. Uh, which includes retrotransposable elements and long non-coding RNAs and have characterized a remarkable similarity 
with the mobile genetic landscape of humans and other mammals with high cognitive function. Um, this finding is a, a trifecta of salience as it reveals a uh, new and deeper understanding of the critical role of non-coding DNA, what has historically been called junk DNA, uh, which comprises more than 98% of the human genome. Uh, the molecular mechanisms underlying intelligence and cognitive capabilities of animals and how intelligence and cognitive capabilities emerged evolutionarily. And it's really fascinating that uh, these uh, genetic agents that seem to have an intelligence of their own, you know, so talking about that scale-free cognition, uh, are conferring uh, higher order intelligence at the organismal level via their gene modification activities. Uh, and this is now documented in two evolutionarily distinct species, humans and in octopuses or uh, cephalopods in general. Uh, so um, at least one takeaway to highlight from the study is that it, it confronts a conventional perspective on the evolution of intelligence, uh, that it must be a very slow and gradual process. Uh, the reasoning being that something as complex and sophisticated as, as intelligence must take a very long time to develop. However, the strong link that is developing in our understanding between intelligence and the role of transposable genetic elements also points to how sophisticated cognitive capabilities can develop rapidly and punctuated or even saltatory evolutionary leaps as mobile genetic elements are also integral to accelerating evolvability and rapidly generating genomic recombination events and novel phenotypes. Um, and this is actually uh, a study that we're working on, uh, research that we're uh, in the process of performing uh, to show how line one uh, long interspersed nuclear elements, transposable elements, uh, line one activation, and genomic recombination can be linked to the hyperintelligence of the space memory network, and therefore is directional and goal oriented. Uh, so you know it's observed, uh, like within the human brain, that uh, where you have neuroblasts, neuronal stem cells, you have strong activation of these transposable elements, which are recombining or reconfigurating the genome, basically producing a new genome. That's the genetic mosaicism. Uh, and that these uh, neurons, resulting neurons with a new genotype and hence a new phenotype uh, are going to critical regions in the brain involved in memory and learning like the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, uh, and, and uh, the neocortex. Uh, but so what uh, is it about this nuclear recombination and these mobile genetic elements that are linked with learning and memory? Um, and so one of the things that, that we're investigating is how um, that nuclear recombination can occur via a non-random process. Uh, so a goal-oriented, uh, intelligently directed process that occurs via feedback feedforward mechanisms with the space memory network. Uh, so that, you know, it's it's not just random changes, but functional changes. Uh, th th this will hopefully be, um, th this research will hopefully be finished soon and we'll have uh, this um, available uh, via publication. Um, and one final study that we'll look at that, um, validates uh, another one of our postulates uh, is especially, you know, regarding uh, these transposable elements, long non-coding RNA and otherwise a uh, non-coding um, protein regions uh, of the genome. A study has found a human gene linked to larger brains arose from non-protein coding, i.e. junk DNA. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I still incorporate that term junk DNA because people still use it. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, so, you know, I'm trying to point out that you shouldn't use it. <laughs> you shouldn't, shouldn't call it uh, junk DNA. Um, you know, maybe uh, 
you know, just referred to as non-protein coding DNA uh, because, you know, it's uh, definitely not junk. Uh, but uh, researchers have discovered a key process by which new genes from non-protein coding DNA undergoes mutations to enable export from the nucleus into the cellular cytoplasm, uh, where the new gene can be translated into novel polypeptides. In the new study, the researchers have shown that far from being accessories, uh, new gene products are often integral and in key phenotype characteristics, such as larger brains and human-specific de novo genes from non-protein coding DNA. Um, and one of the things that this uh, recent study did was uh, show how uh, these non-protein coding sequences uh, can exact uh, the gene signaling sequences that enable uh, export from the nucleus where they can be translated into proteins and then import uh, back into the nucleus where they can affect uh, gene regulatory networks or go on to affect the phenotype like causing proliferation of neurons to build a larger brain. Uh, so it's a really uh, remarkable uh, study. Uh, and again, um, this uh, article I wrote about it is available on the RSF website in the science section. Uh, and I believe I have this linked in the members portal as well. Um, and uh, the, the study elucidates the mutations involved in enabling nuclear export where the new gene can access the translational machinery of the ribosome and demonstrates via knockout and overexpression experiments. Uh, so that's where the gene, uh, so that they identified this de novo gene that came from a non-protein coding region. Uh, they can, uh, in cell constructs, knock that gene out or duplicate its copy number and have it overexpressed and they can see what kind of phenotype changes you get from doing that. Uh, and in those experiments, uh, you know, they found the, uh, the functional role of these uh, 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 the de novo genes from uh, non-protein coding DNA in organisms uh, having significant roles in development, like the enlargement of the cerebral cortex in humans, a really remarkable finding. Um, this is some of the, the background of the story. Uh, so Chuan uh, Yun Li, an evolutionary biologist at Peking University, and colleagues discovered that some human protein genes bore a striking resemblance to DNA sequences in rhesus monkeys that got terms transcribed into long non-coding RNAs. Uh, so there's this uh, same homology or similarity uh, in these evolutionarily closely related species. But in us, these were protein coding genes and in this cousin species, they're non-protein coding genes, long non-coding RNAs. <laughs> Lee uh, couldn't figure out what it, uh, what it had taken for those stretches of monkey DNA to become true protein coding genes in humans, uh, and which, as they demonstrate, led to the enlargement of the brain uh, from the size of uh, a macaque to a human brain. Uh, so Lee's team scoured the human and ch chimpanzee genomes for de novo protein coding genes that had long non-coding RNA counterparts in rhesus monkeys, as well as the crucial U1 element mutations needed to exit the nucleus. That's the, the modification that allows export of messenger RNA from the nucleus to the ribosome where it can be translated into protein. Eventually, they came up with 45 exclusively human genes and 29 genes shared by humans and chimps that fit the bill. Next, the researchers homed in on nine of these protein genes that are active in the human brain to see whether they could learn what each was doing. Uh, so when Hu introduced one of these genes into mice, their brains also grew larger than normal and developed a bigger cortex with that wrinkly, sulky, and gyre outer layer that's typical of a mammalian brain and especially humans and is responsible for higher level functions such as uh, reasoning and language. Uh, this was reported in Advanced Science, the journal. 
So uh, de novo genes with a long non-coding RNA origin encode unique human brain development functionality. Uh, so they um, did this uh, sequencing uh, and were able to identify these novel genes and specific tissues in the human. Um, and, uh, you know, the, these genes uh, have orthologs or homologs uh, with non-protein coding sequences uh, in the rhesus monkeys. Uh, so at some, so the idea is that at some point in uh, evolutionary history, these were exapted, these RNA non-coding sequences were exapted and became fully functional genes that are directly responsible for making humans humans, uh, like the large brain, because there's a high degree of expression. And you can see in this heat map, that's the, the red section here. These are novel protein coding genes that they've identified. There's a large expression uh, in the brain of these um, novel uh, protein coding sequences, they came from junk DNA, from, from non-coding uh, protein uh, DNA. Um, so it identified a, a human-specific gene that plays a key role in developing large complex brains that arose from long non-coding RNA. They depict that with a star here. This is a gene they identified that has a direct role in uh, growing larger brains. Uh, the, study, the study's authors were able to show how the gene originated from long non-coding RNA via uh, compar comparative analysis uh, with our closely related species here, um, showing homology between the gene and the long non-coding RNA-specific sequences and identifying key changes in RNA splice-related sequences that enabled RNA nuclear export where the mRNA uh, could then be translated by ribosomes and form new proteins, novel proteins, that then go and cause larger brains. Uh, via introduction of new splicing elements, the long non-coding RNA sequences are changed to be able to leave the nucleus where there is access to the ribosome thus becoming functional mRNA transcripts. Uh, perhaps the most surprising result of the study is that these newly generated de novo genes from long non-coding RNA sequences even have biological functionality at all. Um, they say within the traditional theory of evolution and development, this is a surprising finding and relatively unexplainable because it's almost like these long non-coding RNA sequences that are lying in the non-protein coding regions of the DNA are uh, pre-loaded with functionality. And all that's required is a few modifications, some RNA splicing during messenger, uh, messenger RNA transcription processes uh, for these let's say dormant protein regions to be rapidly exapted uh, and become functional and drive significant evolutionary changes. This is very remarkable. Um, but again, it's something that uh, I discussed a decade ago. <laughs> it's a, a, a prediction that I, I made a long time ago. Uh, now, uh, for this latter characteristic, uh, the, the research team identified 74 human hominoid-specific novel genes, five of which emerged after the ancestral split of the human and chimpanzee lineages. Uh, so they identified 74 of these novel uh, genes that came from long uh, non-coding uh, RNA transcripts. Um, So uh, the uh, uh, selecting one of these 74 genes uh, that is uh, human specific uh, and expression of brain development, uh, the research team demonstrated experimentally that knockout or overexpression of the gene in human embryonic stem cells accelerated or delayed the neuronal maturation of cortical organoids respectively. Uh, so the um, novel gene was playing a direct role in brain development. Uh, what's more, when the gene was ectopically expressed in transgenic mice, 
the test organisms developed in large brains with higher cortical structure like infolding, a human-like characteristic typical of brain morphology in the brain cortex. Uh, so when this gene was expressed in mice, they grew larger brains and their cortex started to form these folding patterns typical of the higher cortex region of humans. Uh, so I, I saw I see a question that came up. Uh, is the AR RNA editing uh, the same mechanism that cephal cephalopods use to edit RNA without altering its DNA? Um, and indeed, that is the case. Uh, so if we go back here uh, and look at that um, study that found uh, octopuses with uh, rapid RNA editing responses, uh, they are using that um, ADAR mechanism, uh, the ADAR enzyme, uh, which is, uh, that stands for adenosine deaminases that act on RNA, ADAR. Uh, and um, th there's more than just one kind of this because uh, you can have A to I, you can have other kinds of RNA modifications. Like, like I had mentioned, there's over 150 different kind of modifications that can occur. Uh, this is just one of the, the best, uh, the most well-known, uh, but indeed, um, so the, the, the oct octopuses uh, are using this same kind of uh, mechanism uh, for uh, rapid evolutionary responses uh, via changing, editing the transcriptome and epigenetic mechanism. Uh, and that does point to the fact that uh, this gene editing mechanism uh, occurred early on in uh, the evolution and development of multicellular organisms. Uh, it was probably this kind of adaptation that caused, that, that enabled increased evolvability, uh, that uh, enabled uh, unicellular organisms to form multicellular congregates uh, uh, and grow into multicellular organisms. <clears throat> 